Okay, so today we are going to do the first in a, perhaps a series of videos, an absolute beginner's guide to flying aircraft and more correctly to flying aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator. So if you've never flown an aeroplane before, you maybe messed around with video games and maybe you've gone wildly out of control. So I thought it might be useful to do an absolute beginner's guide of how, how aeroplanes work and to actually demonstrate some of the concepts. And to help me do that, I've wired up a webcam that's pointing at my hands on the controllers. So you can see I have got a Thrustmaster stick here and it's got a throttle control. And it's also got a joystick. Yeah. And you can see you can see straight away on the screen when I waggle the joystick around the control surfaces are move are moving. So straight away we can start to talk about how an aeroplane works. When we pull the stick back you will see the elevators at the back of the plane, the control surfaces at the back of the plane tip up. So if you imagine the aeroplane is flying through the air forwards, there is air rushing over the tail. If we pull back the tail is pushed downwards because of the deflection of the elevators. And if the tail is pushed downwards, that means the nose is pushed upwards relative to where we'll be sitting inside the plane. If we press forwards on the stick, you will see the elevators move downwards. So while going through the air, that will cause the tail to go up, which will make the nose in turn go down because you have to remember the plane rotates around the axis of the wing it's hanging on the wing when you're flying through the air by the same token we can twist on, on my controls I don't have rudder pedals which is quite useful for this because then you don't have to have a, an extra camera pointing at my feet if I twist this joystick it moves the rudder yeah so if we were to twist left that means the you can see the rudder there has twisted to the left which means if we were flying through the air the tail would be pushed right which means the nose would be pushed left if you imagine there's a, a, a stick through the middle of the airplane it's going to rotate around that stick so by pushing the rudder one way we push the tail one way and the nose the other so if I steer left the tail goes right the nose goes the nose goes to the left so we turn left and that's pretty much it. The, other, the only other major control we've got here is the throttle. So if we go and jump inside the aeroplane, this is a standard instrument stack that you see in an aeroplane. We're not going to get into any of the navigation instruments or anything today, but we are going to talk a little bit about what some of the knobs and dials do. So perhaps the most important one here is the throttle. On lots of the smaller aeroplanes have a push rod throttle. If you imagine if you've ever, if you've got a petrol mower for your lawn or anything like that, you pull a cable that opens up a valve that lets fuel into the engine. And that's essentially what the throttle lever does. So as we push our throttle forwards on this control, you can see the throttle being pushed in and out. Yeah, so all it's doing when you push it forwards it's actually opening a valve on the engine that's letting fuel in. You will see next to it there is a mixture control. Now at the moment it says cut, so the, by default when you leave an aeroplane on the ground you cut the mixture. But if we push it all the way in you can see it's got a percentage. When it's pushed all the way in that is taken to be a rich mixture in a Cessna. When you pull it out you are leaning the mixture out. Now what does that mean? A rich mixture means we are providing as much fuel as possible. It's, if you think about a fuel and air mixture, in order to burn the fuel, you need air in with the fuel. So a rich mixture means you've got a small amount of air for the amount of fuel you're burning. And at sea level, that's fine. And it's set up so it's 100%. That's perfect for at sea level. The engine will burn all the fuel you can throw at it at that at that setting. As you get higher in altitude the air thins out so you need more air to burn the same amount of fuel. Now obviously you can't control the amount of air coming into the engine but you can control the amount of fuel being fired in with the air into the the carburettors if that makes sense. So by leaning this out you are reducing the amount of fuel going into the internals of the engine to match 
the amount of air that's coming in so you don't get unburnt fuel does that make sense and it means the engine runs more efficiently and that's as technical as we're going to get today airspeed this is indicated airspeed so there's a pit hot tube i think on a cessna here it is over here so that will map that will measure the um pressure of the air hitting the airplane and you get your indicated airspeed which may differ from your speed over the ground we're not going to get into that here's the artificial horizon you will notice it's on its side at the moment many of these instruments are powered instruments you need to be running the engine for them to actually start working properly here's the altitude so it's showing your feet above sea level not above the floor that you can see okay now you can tune this around but you don't do it for the ground you do it for the atmospheric pressure that you're that you are experiencing now if you look very closely you can see a millibar rating there so you would get a weather report from the airfield and that would have the millibar number on it and then you can go and tune your altitude in so you know exactly that the the altitude matches the height above the sea you are actually at so you've got an accurate altitude above sea above sea level uh, you've got a compass pretty obvious um you again you can you can tune that as well i'm going to leave it where it is you've actually got a magnetic compass up here as well so what else have we got um vertical speed so the amount you are traveling upwards or downwards in the air once you're flying along will be indicated on here so and that's all we need to know for today so to get the engine or to get the cessna started we have moved the mixture to rich or 100 percent we are going to turn on the electrics i don't think we need to use the primer in microsoft flight simulator but we'll soon find out the parking brake is on and we turn the key now it shouldn't start is it going to start no there's a very good reason for that if we look further down here on the on the floor there is a fuel switch so we have to turn on the master switch for the fuel to allow the fuel into the engine so if we look outside the fuel in a Cessna is held in the wings so it is gravity fed down into the engine so unless you allow the fuel this is the master tap for the fuel unless you turn on that master tap the fuel doesn't get to the engine yeah so now if we start the engine and it's running okay so time to use controls there's a bit of a kind of a, a discrepancy in microsoft flight simulator that it doesn't give you a difference between nose wheel steering and rudder but on a small airplane it doesn't make any difference they are usually linked so if we go and look outside and we move the the view around you will notice when i twist the rudder nothing happens to the nose wheel now watch what happens if i start moving forwards so oh i have, I have to come off the parking brake first so we have to push this in and you will notice that's actually animated really nicely in the simulator yeah when you put the parking brake on or off you can see the pedals move because in the real aircraft you tip the pedals to brake yeah so when you're going down the runway you tip your toes forwards and that breaks okay so i've come off the parking brakes i'm not going to worry about these people being in my way they're just animated people and they always get in the way of everybody so i'm going to plow straight through them but i'm more interested in showing you what happens to the nose wheel when we start moving so I'm in increasing the throttle. Now did you see, well, as soon as we're moving, I can do this with the twist grip to show you what's happening a bit more, obviously. As soon as we're moving, the rudder and the nose wheel are um, moving together. On the big jets that shouldn't happen. On the big jets they have a tiller in the cockpit, a separate lever for operating the nose wheel. Okay, so we can see all the controls are moving when we when we stir the stick around. So we can see we've got ailerons, we've got elevators and we've got rudder. So let's go back inside, press F to centre our view up, 
press space so we can see over the nose a little bit more easily. Space just toggles your view up and down. In the real aeroplane you might be sitting up. Okay, so all we're doing now is steering by twisting the stick or import, imparting the rudder and nose wheel and we're using the throttle to move ourselves forwards. Now on my controls I've also got the trigger configured as wheel brakes. So I can hold the trigger in and bring us to a stop. Okay. So let's roll round onto the runway. So we are at Booker Airfield in Buckinghamshire in England. It's just down the road from where I live, so that's the only reason for choosing it. So let's stop on the runway, ready to go. So what we're going to do now is increase the throttle to full and then the plane will be pulled to one side at first by the engine and secondarily by any crosswinds that happen to be blowing across the airfield. Now, usually in Flight Simulator, if you look carefully, you can see a windsock. I'm not sure, it's over there, look. You can just about see it. If we zoom in, so it looks like we're going to have a very slight tailwind because the angle of this dragging would give you an indication of how fast the wind is. So if we look from this view, yeah, you can just about see the windsock. So it's not ideal that we're taking off with this kind of very slight breeze, but we're not going to worry too much about that. Okay. So, full throttle. I'm immediately having to twist right to hold the torque of the engine, which is trying to pull the plane to the, to the left. But now the wind is starting to affect us and the plane is starting to go right. So we've obviously got an a part of the wind is coming from the right, pushing the tail left. So once we've got enough speed up, I'm watching the speed at the bottom left there, we're gonna pull back. That pushes the tail down, lifts the nose. The air gets under the wings and pushes the plane into the air. So we're now just using the stick. So if I push forwards, the nose goes down. If I pulls back, pull back, the nose goes up. The sound you heard then is a stall warning. Or actually it's um, an angle of attack warning. If you imagine the plane is always skidding through the air, it doesn't fly in a dead straight line. It kind of skids along. And if the angle you are skidding at becomes too much, the wing stops working and you hear that sound. So we'll, we'll go around a tight corner. So I'm going to use the ailerons to tip us over and we'll pull and pull and pull back and back. And you can hear the, the warning. That's because we are skidding the plane around the corner and the angle of the wing to the air is too much. Now that sound is actually made by a kind of a, a more expensive version of a child's toy. If you imagine a recorder in the wing, that's what's making that noise. But the recorder is at an angle, so it only works when the airflow is hitting it. So if you imagine the recorder is at a down angle, as soon as the, the wing is at a high enough angle to the oncoming air, the, the instrument works and it makes the noise. So let's do it again. Yeah? You can do the same thing just by going slowly. Remember, we're skidding through the air. So if we cut the engine, I've pulled the engine back, we're going very, very slowly, and you can see the indicated airspeed is coming down. 60 knots. Well, I'm, I'm pulling back more and more and more on the stick because the plane is wanting to fall to the floor. And there goes the stall warning. Now one wing will usually stall before the other because they're not perfectly the same as each other. So I'm now pulling back as hard as I can. And the left wing is stalled first. And we're just gonna hit the treetops and we're back flying again. Okay, so let's get into some basic flying controls. So I've got trim set up on the hat. So you can see if I let go, the nose is falling to the floor. So I can actually trim the elevator by pulling back on this small stick, which means I'm effectively pulling back a small amount all the time by doing that. Yeah? So now I don't have to anymore. And I can push the stick over, 
Notice the plane only rotates on its axis while I'm pushing the stick. As soon as I let go, it stops doing it. If I push the stick the other way, it will start rotating, let go, and it flies along however I left it. If I push left again till it's upright, we're flying along quite happily. Now if I go faster, there will be more, as we get faster there's more air going over the wing, the wing works better, generates more lift, and it lifts the nose up. You can see that happening. If I cut the engine, we slow down, less air going over the wing, and the nose starts to drop. The reason for that is the centre of gravity of an aeroplane is ahead of the wing, so you imagine there's an engine in the front. Yeah? So the wing is working to lift the engine all the time. So the slower you go, the more the engine wins in that formula. The faster you go, the wing makes enough lift to beat the weight of the engine. So without using the elevators, we can control going up and down purely by speed as well. So the faster we go, the more the nose will come up. Yeah, there it goes, look. And we slow down, and the nose starts to drop. So you end up actually balancing forces most of the time. So you're going to get, I'm going to put on 50% throttle and we'll let the aeroplane speed stabilise out for going that speed. So I'll get the nose down for a moment. And it's fairly happy. We need a bit of trim forwards. And there you go. So the plane is almost flying itself. Yeah. Okay, let's do a circuit round. So I'm going to tip it on its side to turn. Now, if you'll notice, when I tip it on its side, the amount of lift the wings were generating is no longer straight up, it's off to one side. So the amount of force straight away from the ground isn't the same anymore. So the nose starts to drop. It's more pronounced the more you do it. So if I turn the aeroplane right on its side, the nose is dropping towards the floor. That's because the, the lift we are generating is at an angle to the ground. It's not straight away from the ground. If we lift the plane back to level, we've obviously increased in speed as we dove towards the ground, and now that's, that's resulted in more lift, nose comes up, and then it balances. Look, we went uphill, the plane ran out to speed, the lift ran out, and we're back level again. And it will keep doing that, yeah? Almost like a, a fairground ride, until it stabilises again. We're not going to wait for it to stabilise, so we're just going to... So the idea is, you turn it into the turn you want to make, and you start gently pulling back on the stick to hold the horizon level. Yeah, and you can just keep turning all day long. As long as the engine's running, you can keep turning. It's worth pointing out, I've only got 50% on the throttle. It's halfway on its travel. You very rarely need to be running full throttle in an aeroplane and indeed in most aeroplanes it will actually damage the engine if you run full throttle for too long. The, generally the more powerful the engine the more damage it's going to do the more you run it at full throttle. Quite strangely the, the big jets if you go fully manual things like the 737 you can go quite far beyond what they regard as 100% throttle and it will let you do it, but obviously you can damage the engine in doing so. You know, if you leave it on it for 10 minutes, running at say 104% or something crazy. But it's there for emergency use. Okay, so we, we're turning there, if we turn back the other way. So we could actually trim the elevators to keep the nose. So I'm just doing that now with that switch, pushing forwards and backwards which is the same as pushing forwards or backwards, but only a small amount. The problem with trimming for a turn is you don't keep turning forever typically, and you'll want to come out of the turn eventually. So alongside the simulator, I'm also running a piece of software called Little NavMap. Oh no, I'm not actually. I thought I was. So we need to keep an eye out for the airfield that we took off from. So if we have a look around, we'll go to the outside view to do this. We're looking for a flashing beacon. 
and then we'll know what direction to get, go to get back to the airfield. Now, if we gain more altitude, there's a river over there, so I know that that's Marlow. So I've increased the throttle to, to maximum, meaning we can climb, and it's actually the airplane's getting slow. The reason we're doing this, obviously, is the higher you are, the more clearly you can see the scenery around you, and you can see the airfield over there. There's a beacon in the distance, flashing away. Okay, so that's the edge of Marley. That's High Wycombe. Yeah. And that's the River Thames over there that's snaking past Marley. Okay. So you can see the beacon, that's the beacon at the airfield. The runway is in that flat field just there. So we are going to use the ailerons to steer aeroplane towards the direction we want to go. You'll notice we haven't really used the rudder since we took off. If I use the rudder, you see what it does. It skids the plane sideways. And you'll also notice it's affecting the angle the plane is meeting the air. So if we twist hard right, the plane starts to go into the ground, or the left wing came up. The reason for that, if you think about it, if we twist the aeroplane to the right, the left wing hits the air first and generates more lift than the right wing. So the left wing goes up. If we do the same, if we turn right and don't do anything else, the right wing goes forwards and generates more lift than the left wing. So the right wing goes up. So let's just turn back. So by just by turning the plane on its side and pulling back gently is a much more controlled way of turning than forcing it to skid round a corner with the rudder. Yeah, you can hear the plane groaning when I do that. There's an aeroplane taking off on runway 24. So we're going to turn right to 60 degrees in a moment. So if you remember, we looked at the instruments. We've got the compass down here. So we're going to fly along. We're at 1,000 feet, which we can see here. The small needle is thousands. So we've just come up to just gone 60 degrees. So we're flying along at 60 degrees. Let's um, trim the elevators so we don't have to do anything. Flying along at 1,000 feet, so the small needle is thousands, the big needle is hundreds. There's the vertical speed, so we're going ever so slightly up. But now we're going ever so slightly down. But remember, when we go downhill, the plane picks up speed and the wings generate more lift. So the speed is ever so gently increasing. Lift comes up because of the speed. And we generate more lift and the nose comes up. So we're going up again. So without touching the controls, I'm just letting the aeroplane fly through the air and do what it wants to do. Now, while we were doing that, the crosswind has pushed the tail round. Yeah, so we've moved away from 60 degrees. So you have to remember, if we look outside, if you have, an air, if you have the wind hitting the aeroplane from the side, there's this great big slab here that is going to cause the aeroplane to rotate towards the direction the wind is coming from. Like a weather vane. Does that make sense? So you can see the runway over there. So we are going to turn in by tipping the ailerons to rotate the aeroplane, then hold just pulling back ever so gently. Pulling the, the throttle back, so we're starting to slow down. And there's the runway, so we're a little bit off to the right, so we'll carry on turning past the runway for a few moments. Throttle back to idle. 
going to drop the flaps. I've not really talked about flaps, so we'll come back round and I'll talk about flaps in a moment. So throttles on idle, we're just falling towards the floor, but obviously because we're going downhill, we're holding the same kind of speed all the way down. Now there is a plane there, so I'm going to be nice and go round. So back to 50% throttle, lift the flaps back up. So we're going to carry on along the runway and then turn left. So we're doing 240 degrees at the moment. So we tip the stick sideways gently, which puts the plane into the turn. And then we're just using the elevator to hold the nose up. So we're pulling back gently. And we keep going around the corner until we're back at 60 degrees again. We could even increase the power and climb, so pull back even more to raise the nose to get us back to a thousand feet. Okay, so we're now back at about 65 degrees, so we're still pulling. If we watch the airspeed indicator, we're getting really slow, we're only doing about 50 knots, which isn't great, but we're up to a thousand feet now. Now if we level out and watch the vertical speed to know if we're going up or down, then we can come back to 50% throttle and we could use the trim. Now let's describe what the flaps do. So in normal level flight the plane will happily fly along at a given speed. So you can see here we're doing sort of 70 or 80 knots and it's quite happy doing that. If we want to go really slowly to land we can actually change the shape of the wing to force more air down, which forces the aeroplane up, yeah? So to do that, you can use the flaps. Now I've got the flaps mapped to buttons, but let's watch what happens. When I drop the flaps, those big slabs on the inside part of the wing drop. So that forces the air down and the aeroplane up. I can do it several times. Three times, look. And the, the net result of doing that is the plane can fly more slowly through the air. Because the, it's kind of like the wing is grabbing the air and forcing it down, which is forcing the plane upwards. So if we go back inside, we can see we're quite happily flying along. OK, we've got a stall warning, but we're if you look at vertical speed, it's zero, but we're doing 30 knots. So I'm going to go full throttle. And the only problem with the flaps is they generate a lot of drag, because you imagine that it's like barn doors hanging off the aeroplane. So I'm lifting the flaps, and the speed is coming back. Okay, so let's make this turn back again. So we're up to 1500 feet. We got very high while we were doing that. So I'm going to cut the engine completely back to idle and we're almost gliding back now. So we should see the airfield out in front of us soon. Yep, there's the runway. So let's drop the flaps. Two notches, we don't need all three. Now the, the other benefit of having the flaps down is when we lower the nose to fly towards the runway, the plane is not going to accelerate because they produce so much drag. Yeah, because those big barn doors hanging down into the airflow, if you look sideways at them, or well, let's sit down in the seat so we can see them, with these hanging down, that's a lot of drag, that's a lot of surface area that's hanging in the air now. It stops the plane accelerating as we drift back down to the ground. If we didn't have the flaps, we would keep accelerating like a roller coaster. So they kind of have two duties on landing. We can slow the plane down as we descend from the sky and they allow us to go more slowly. So we're just turning gently towards the runway. I don't think that plane's going to do anything. He's been sat there for quite some time. So go for the final level of flaps. we pull up, we are now skidding along through the air, look, with the nose high in the air, and there's the ground. 
Now, did you notice the plane kicked to one side? People seem to think that's not realistic. It's absolutely realistic. As soon as the tyres touch the ground, they provide a what you might call a moment, a pivot point for the aeroplane that's fixed. So the wind hitting the tail will suddenly rotate the aeroplane around the point the aeroplane is touching the ground. Which is what you saw. So the, um, the moment your tyres touch the ground you have to be ready with the nose wheel and the rudder to steer the plane back towards the centre line of the runway. Okay, so I wonder what that person's doing. They've been sat there for quite some time. Perhaps they're playing around with the cockpit trying to figure out what they're doing. They really shouldn't do that on the start of the runway though. They should do that on a taxiway. Or oh, sorry, on a parking area. So we're going to divert back across to the buildings. This is just a stock scenery for Booker, by the way. You can get a massive upgrade to it that makes it look exactly like the real place. It's not very expensive, but I'm quite happy with using it out of the box. And this plane's an out of the box aircraft as well, so if you wanted to replicate this flight, you can. Okay, so let's go and park up. Back where we started from. We can we can either use the keyboard to set the parking brake, or we can do the result, or you know, you can pull this lever which does exactly the same thing. Okay, so to cut the engine, we can turn the key and you'll see it will slowly die. Let's keep an eye on it. There it goes. We can turn the fuel back off. We can turn the switches back off. Now in a real flight, I, okay, I was just concentrating on the controls of the aircraft. In a real flight, you would be looking at the lights as well. So you would have switched the lights on, you would have perhaps communicated with air traffic control or Unicom, as it's called, as well. We didn't do any of that. We were just interested in operating the aeroplane today. So we, there's a lot of things we didn't do. Oh, by the way, to get the um, the yoke out of the way so I could see the switches and things, you can just click on the stalk for the yoke and it vanishes or comes back. So there you go. I'll stop the recording there.